Right, good morning and uh, welcome to everyone to this morning's webinar. I am a little bit minute early, but hopefully uh, lots of you started joining um, and um, we will just kick off this morning. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Marie Chang and I'm the Partnerships Manager here at MyHL Toolkit and I'd like to obviously welcome you all this morning to uh, this morning's webinar. Um, so if this is not the first time that you've joined, you'd notice that we've been doing quite a lot of webinars. We did a lot of webinars from the start of lockdown and we've just been continuing doing that on a various different uh, topics from um, HR to business topics to uh, quite topical issues around COVID-19, which have all been really popular. So today we are joined by Sarah Edwards. Uh, she is a Senior Employment Law Advisor at Howarth, who's going to be running through how to conduct a disciplinary investigation thoroughly and fairly from start to finish. So she'll be able to go through that shortly. Um, Sarah's going to spend about 20-25 minutes talking about the process and then at the end we'll have time uh, to answer some of your questions. So um, you will see at the bottom of your screens there is a, a toolbar there with a Q&A box so we would encourage you to add any questions as you're going along um, into that box. Um, if we could put, get you to put them into that box just so that we don't get them lost in the chat that'd be really good. Um, also you would have seen the Zoom chat which some of you've been ch chatting on already. Um, but yeah, as I said, if you could ask your questions in the Q&A, that would be great. A uh, bit of housekeeping, housekeeping, just to clarify, today's session is offering general advice, tips and best practice. And if you'd like to join us on our next webinar, I will add a link to our next registration page, which is on how to manage flexible working requests, which is on the 11th of August, I believe. So I'll add that to the registration page um, into the chat once we get started. Uh, so in terms of introductions, so here this morning to talk to us about how to conduct a disciplinary investigation is Sarah, and I will pass over to Sarah to introduce herself. So I will let me do that. Thank you, Marie. That's great. Um, yeah, as Marie says, I'm Sarah Edwards. I am a senior employment law solicitor at Howarth's. Um, I have been an employment solicitor for ooh, 10 years now since I qualified. Makes me feel old. Um, so I've always specialised in employment law since qualifying as a solicitor and did a year of employment law uh, prior to qualification as well. Um, I spent the first part of my career working with employees um, pursuing tribunal claims on their behalf and then sort of the second half of my career here at Howarth's representing businesses. Um, so a nice, a nice mix for me. I quite like having had both, both lots of experience and certainly I think helps me to understand both sides uh, of an argument when looking at things like disciplinaries. So what I want to talk to you about today uh, as Marie says, it is very much focusing on disciplinary matters and disciplinary investigations in particular. So I want to cover um, why we have disciplinary procedures in the first instance, um, give you a general overview of what that process looks like um, and discuss in more detail the points to consider when conducting a disciplinary investigation. So investigations are tied up very much in the rest of the disciplinary process. And um, that's why I'm going to have a look at it a lot in general, but focusing on investigations rather than just solely looking at investigations. Um, it's likely that almost all managers and businesses will at some point encounter a conduct or performance issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, they can be minor issues like single lateness incidents, right up to serious gross misconduct allegations like sexual harassment or theft. It doesn't actually matter which end of the spectrum you're dealing with, for the most part. Um, when a conduct issue does arise that warrants disciplinary action, the general process is always the same. So the type and extent of the investigation you do and the evidence that you gather is going to be different um, along with the outcome, but the overall process is ultimately the same. Um, so first of all, looking at why disciplinary procedures are important, and obviously part of any disciplinary procedure is the investigation. So as an employment solicitor, I am always banging on about following correct procedure. Um, and it can, sometimes feel like you're following a process just to jump through certain hoops but there is a reason why we apply 
relatively strict disciplinary procedures to a situation. And um, there are three, in, in my view, three main reasons why uh, disciplinary procedures are important. So the first one is that section one of the Employment Rights Act requires an employer to inform an employee of where they can obtain a copy of the disciplinary procedure um, and of some of the key details within it. And off the back of that, before starting any formal disciplinary process, an employer has to consider the status of its disciplinary procedure. So by that, I mean really whether or not the procedure is a contractual one or a non-contractual one. Every procedure has certain stages, um, but a contractual procedure will require an employer to follow each specific step without deviation. Otherwise, there could be a breach of contract claim on top of anything else. Um, it's generally better to have uh, non-contractual disciplinary procedures. And um, that makes it much easier for you to change it if you need to and um, depart from it where that's necessary. Um, and really make sure that it properly applies to the circumstances. Um, it also avoids any arguments that employees have a contractual right not to be dismissed until the whole procedure has been followed um, and making sure that dismissal isn't in breach of contract. The second reason why they're important relates to unfair dismissal. Um, employees can only be fairly dismissed in certain specific circumstances. So any dismissal for a reason other than the permitted reasons will be unfair. One of the fair reasons for dismissal is conduct. And when dealing with conduct issues, you're applying your disciplinary procedure. When a disciplinary procedure results in dismissal for misconduct, one major factor in, in, in assessing whether or not that dismissal is fair is whether the employer followed a fair and reasonable procedure. So following a fair, transparent and consistent process and dealing with potentially difficult issues promptly and, and ultimately head on um, can go a long way to reducing any risks of unfair dismissal. The third reason is the ACAS uplift. So ACAS produce a code of practice on disciplinary and grievance procedures, which um, sets out for employers and employees how what, what the sort of good practice guide is for fair conduct of disciplinary procedures. Um, most disciplinary procedures will incorporate the minimum requirements set out by ACAS, but can also cover other matters. Um, failure to follow any part of the ACAS code doesn't of itself uh, make you liable for claims or proceedings, but the tribunal does have to take into account the ACAS code when considering whether an employer has acted reasonably or not. Um, also, if an employee wins an unfair dismissal case, the tribunal can increase the amount of compensation awarded by up to 25% if an employer has failed to follow the ACAS code and that basic procedure, um, which is ultimately just gifting compensation to an employee if you don't follow that procedure. Um, so as a general overview, looking then at what uh, a disciplinary procedure involves. Um, as I say, I don't intend to go through every stage of the disciplinary procedure in detail. Um, I'm going to go uh, and provide a general overview of the steps involved, looking at the key parts of it, and then focus more on investigations. So um, I'm also going to focus on formal procedures rather than informal procedures. Broadly speaking, um, a formal process involves identifying the allegations that are being pursued, investigating that alleged misconduct, those allegations, um, considering whether or not to suspend, um, setting, uh, sending written, a written invite to a disciplinary meeting um, if the investigation has identified that there's a case to answer, conducting the disciplinary hearing, um, communicating the outcome to the employee and providing the employee with a right of appeal. They're the basic steps in any disciplinary procedure, really. Um, and the purpose of that really comes down to the fact that an employee has the right to know what case is being brought against them 
They should be given reasonable time to prepare the defence and they should be given an opportunity to put forward their version of events, um, which includes any evidence that they want to give. When deciding who's going to conduct a disciplinary meeting, um, you should always bear in mind that there's a general expectation that a different person will carry out each stage of the process. So investigation, disciplinary and appeal. At each step, a person more senior than the last should be managing the next stage. Um, but that said, the size and resources of the business are taken into account when assessing fairness. So no need to panic. If it isn't possible to have someone different and more senior conduct the investigation, disciplinary and appeal, the reasons why and the size of the business will be taken into consideration. So it can still be a fair process, even if you don't have someone different do each step. Um, when inviting an employee to a disciplinary meeting, uh, there are certain specific things that you have to inform them of. And you also need to give them a minimum of 48 hours notice of the meeting. The 48 hours notice uh, is generally accepted to be the minimum amount of time that's reasonable for the employee to prepare. Uh, however, the requirement is actually to give reasonable time. So in complex matters, it might be appropriate to provide a bit longer. The, in the invite, the employer has to inform the employee of the date, time and location of the disciplinary meeting. Confirm who's going to be conducting it and present, um, what the specific allegations are, give copies of any evidence that you're going to refer to or take into consideration, which includes any witness evidence. Inform them of their right to be accompanied by a trade union rep or a work colleague and give an indication of the possible outcome. So it is quite prescribed what should go into an invite letter. Now that's not necessarily prescribed in law in the sense of there's a list in an act that says you must provide these things. It's part of that ACAS guide and also case law that's developed into what really does an employee need to know in advance. It is crucial that the allegations are drafted carefully. Um, it's quite common to run into trouble when allegations don't properly uh, are not properly expressed or where the evidence doesn't actually support the allegations being brought. It's all about the wording um, and the hearing will only deal with the allegations that are set out in the letter. So you need to ensure that everything is notified to the employee in advance as you'll not be able to discuss and bring evidence relating to an allegation that's not been they've not been notified. At disciplinary meetings where the allegations are discussed and the evidence presented by both parties, the disciplining officer will need to consider what the outcome should be. Um, it's always recommended that there be an adjournment of the meeting to make a decision in order to avoid any suggestion that the outcome is predetermined. And um, that's because you're discussing a lot of evidence and issues at a disciplinary meeting. So you need to show that that's been properly thought about and considered before giving an outcome. So an adjournment is a good way to do that. Um, and the employer ha employee has to be given a right of appeal um, and given details of the time scale and, and to whom they need to apply for an appeal. So, as I say, I'm going to focus on investigations. So that's what I'm going to move on to now. Now, the investigation comes right at the beginning of any process, but can also come partway through as well. Uh, you have to investigate to really be able to um, properly understand what allegations are being made and what evidence there is to support them. Now, the reason I focus very much on investigations is partly because that's the topic of the webinar, but equally because actually I think it's one of the most important parts of the process. Um, the requirement for an investigation to take place before a disciplinary hearing or a disciplinary invite is sent, and even to some extent before you even consider suspension, really is crucial and critical to the fairness of the process. Um, in all but the rarest of cases, a failure to investigate properly will fall foul of the ACAS code, principles of fairness established by case law, and therefore lead to an unfair dismissal, ultimately. Um, it's true even in cases of apparently obvious guilt uh, and potentially where the employee admits guilt, there is still a requirement for investigation. Um, however, the amount of investigation and evidence that you gather or that's required 
will vary enormously depending on the individual circumstances of the case, the allegations, whether they've admitted it, what evidence there is, etc. Um, the process of investigation will establish whether there is a case to answer um, and clarify what are the specific allegations that need to be brought against the employee at a disciplinary. So to the extent it's possible to do so, it is important to frame the allegations against the employee accurately right at the start. And that includes at the start of the investigation. Um, firstly, because the content of the allegations will frame the investigation. So you need to know what the allegation is to know what you're investigating, to look for the right evidence, speak to the right people. Uh, and secondly, it, it's a fundamental principle of fairness that the employee knows the case against them. Um, it's a principle that's relevant both at the outset of the investigation and afterwards. So if you decide to proceed, proceed to a disciplinary hearing, you need to make sure those allegations are right and that you fairly investigate. Excuse me. An employer. Um, so the requirement of a fair procedure in relation to investigation is that an investigation um, you have to hold, the investigation has to be reasonable in all the circumstances. That's why it varies so much. Um, and that's judged objectively. So that's judged based on um, what people would generally would consider reasonable rather than what an individual considers reasonable. Um, and it's linked to what we call the band of reasonable responses test. Um, and that's really looking at whether or not the way it's been handled, the amount of investigation is done, the type of investigation that's done, would be considered reasonable by an employer, a reasonable employer. Um, while it is difficult to give hard and fast guidance um, on what a fair procedure is in practice, um, an employer has to investigate sufficiently to ensure that the substance of the allegations is clear and in order to make sure that the allegations can be put to the employee in sufficient detail to allow a meaningful response from them. Um, and it has to be even handed. <coughs> um, you're not expected to leave no stone unturned. Um, it isn't every single thing that might need investigation has to be done, um, but it does need to take you do need to take reasonable steps to carry out fair investigation um, and that inevitably leads to every investigation being a bit different. Um, given that the investigation is arguably the most important part of the process, you need to give very careful consideration to who the investigating officer is going to be. So they need to be properly trained, they need to be capable of conducting a thorough and proper investigation keeping good records of that investigation. And really, most importantly, I think, having the authority to actually access the evidence. It's no good having someone extremely junior investigating a matter if they're not actually going to have access to a lot of the information and evidence because maybe they don't have passwords for systems or they can't access the CCTV, all those kinds of things. So you need to consider carefully who's actually gonna carry it out. Um, the investigation, investigating officer um, is essentially fact finding. They're looking for evidence in relation to a specific allegation um, so that they consider that out, so they can consider that allegation. Um, an investigation meeting isn't a disciplinary meeting um, and the role of the investigator is different and distinct from that of the disciplinary hearing chairperson. The focus is a bit different. So for an investigating officer, um, they are looking, they're not trying to make findings or make decisions about whether or not the employee is culpable or guilty. They don't have to prove guilt or innocence. That's not their job. The investigating officer is there to seek to establish the facts um, insofar as they can, they can by reference to the available evidence. So um, also looking at what can't be established.
So given that there is an allegation present, the investigating officer has to go away and say, OK, well, looking at the evidence available, this is what I can see. These are the facts that I can establish from the information available. And off the back of that, I think there is a case to answer um, or it needs to go further to a disciplinary uh, hearing for someone to make a decision about whether or not um, it ha there has been an act of misconduct. So whereas a disciplining officer at a disciplinary hearing is actually making a decision about sanction, which is a bit different. Um, there are loads of different types of evidence that are relevant to an investigation. And it will vary massively depending on what allegations are being pursued. So the, invest the evidence can be witness evidence, it can be documents, emails, telephone notes and recordings, CCTV, IT, IT monitoring reports and information, notes from management discussions, uh, clocking in and out systems, HR records, loads. So you do have to have someone that can think logically and carefully about what sort of evidence might be available linked to an allegation. Um, most investigations will involve a need to speak to the individual that the allegation is against. Um, and that's because, but, but that's not essential. Um, you, might, you might find that an investigation can focus pretty much completely on the documentary evidence where that's sufficient. But in most cases, you will need to have an investigation meeting and speak to the person that is the subject of that allegation. Um, it's sometimes necessary to speak to the individual before conducting further investigation. So you might start by talking to the person the allegation is against and then go on to look at what other evidence there is uh, in relation to the allegation. Or it might be better to gather your documentary evidence, gather um, information from other sources and then speak to the individual. It just depends really on what the allegation is um, and, and what, what's going to be available, how easy it is to speak to the individual about matters that you're concerned about. Um, there's no right or wrong in that really. Um, it's whatever fits best. Um, there's no limit to how many times you might need to meet with an employee and discuss the allegations before making recommendations um, or deciding whether it's going to go to a disciplinary. Um, and it's ultimately driven by what's reasonable. Um, you might talk to an employee, gather some evidence and need to talk to them again before you go to the next stage. Or you might actually not need to speak to them at all. It's all about what is reasonable in the circumstances. So when you are holding an investigation meeting with an employee, um, ideally before, during that meeting, not necessarily before, there's no formal requirement to send a disciplinary, an invite to an investigation meeting. You can just hold that meeting without an invite, but in some circumstances you might choose to send an invite um, if there's evidence you want them to see in advance, if they're not in the workplace and need to come in, um, if actually it's something that's quite serious that you need them to be aware of beforehand. And there's pros and cons for doing an invite to an investigation meeting in advance, um, but there's no formal requirement to send an invite ahead of time. Um, but the, the things you do need to talk to them about at an investigation meeting are why it's why they're being investigated um what is being being investigated what is the allegation the issue and um, who's actually going to be involved with that um whether there are any witnesses that are going to be spoken to what are the time scales involved for the investigation and the ongoing process and what is the process overall so they do need some basic information to understand where that where they stand essentially um, and also enough information to be able to answer questions um, and give their side of things at, at the investigation stage. It's not quite as formal as the disciplinary stage, um, but uh, it, it requires many of many similar things, really. An employee, now I mentioned before that when you invite to a disciplinary meeting, you have to tell them of their right to be accompanied to that meeting. 
but an employee doesn't have a legal right to be accompanied to an investigation meeting. ACAS guidance suggests that it would be best practice in circumstances where the employee has a disability or they need additional support, um, but it isn't a legal entitlement. Um, it's often helpful, but not always, for an investigator to prepare a report summarising the steps that have been taken in the investigation. So once they've actually looked at it all, spoken to the employees, gathered all the evidence, their job is then to pass it on to somebody who will deal with the disciplinary start stages. Now, often the best way to do that um, is for the investigating person to prepare a report that summarises what steps they've taken to investigate, what the allegations are, what evidence they've found in relation to those allegations, whether that supports them or not. Um, and because that will actually ultimately help the disciplining officer to understand the case that they're actually disciplining for and what steps have been taken, because it might be that further investigation is needed at a later stage by the disciplining person. So it's useful for them to know exactly what's been done so far in case there are any gaps, in case anything new comes up that needs to be looked at. So they're not repeating what's gone before, but can continue doing investigation where necessary. It's not a formal requirement to provide a report, but it's a really good way as well to provide documentary evidence of what you've done if it comes to a tribunal hearing about unfair dismissal. Because if you've got actual written evidence of what the investigation involved, it's quite hard for an employee to then say that certain steps weren't followed. You've told them that they have. Um, once the investigation is complete, um, if there is a decision that formal disciplinary action is needed, so there is a case to answer, um, then the employer needs to write to the employee to confirm the outcome of the investigation in the sense of there is a case to answer, we are therefore inviting you to a disciplinary hearing. Um, and that's when you need to tell them all of those things that I mentioned before um, about the hearing and what's going to happen. And really, in terms of specific investigation, that is about the, the, the crux of it, really, because, as I say, in the, there's no formal absolute steps in an investigation. It's all about what is reasonable in the circumstances, and that's going to vary every time, depending on what it is that you're investigating. Um, so it's really hard to kind of be more specific than that. But always think about ultimately who's doing it, what are the allegations, what evidence is there, who do you need to speak to, um, tell the employee about it and speak to them about it, and then write a report saying whether or not you think there is a disciplinary case to answer based on the facts that you have. That's it really. Um, just a couple of general pointers though before I finish. Um, General matters that relate to the investigation and or the disciplinary. The right to be accompanied, I've mentioned a couple of times. So employees that are attending a disciplinary meeting, not an investigation meeting, a disciplinary meeting, are entitled legally to be accompanied by a trade union rep or a work colleague. So the companion is there to address the disciplinary hearing, which includes putting the employee's case. They can sum up. They can clarify points where there's been a misunderstanding and they can confer with the employee. What they don't have a right to do is answer questions on behalf of the employee. So they're not their legal representative, they are there to accompany. Um, they're not allowed to address the hearing contrary to the employee's wishes. So obviously really they're there to support the employee going forward and not to take over matters. Um, and they can't act in a way that prevents the employer from explaining its case or from any other person making a contribution. So if they're particularly disruptive, they're going against what they're there for, really. Um, a common argument that's put forward from employees in relation to the right to be accompanied is that they're not members of a trade union um, or they don't want their colleagues to know about the disciplinary or more commonly, their colleagues have actually refused to accompany them to the disciplinary because they don't really want to be involved. Um, so they'll often then ask to be accompanied by a friend or a family member. There's 
no legal right to be accompanied by a friend or a family member. So you, as an employer, would be permitted to refuse that request. It's usually worth considering whether having someone else there might actually help matters and facilitate it rather than hinder um, before making a decision, but also recommend that if you are minded to allow a third party's attendance, check their background, make sure they're not legally or HR qualified and sneaking in there as a legal rep rather than just as an accompanying family member for support. There's no general right to be accompanied by a legal advisor. Um, it's actually discouraged in internal matters um, and it's often best avoided anyway. But, um, it, it, well, it puts things on a, a footing that often just goes down the route of litigation rather than resolution. Um, the circumstances in which you might consider having a family and friend as well as whether it assists is if there is a disability uh, issue that requires somebody else to be there. Ultimately. Um, the other general matters, note taking, it's absolutely essential that you keep a proper record of both the investigation and the disciplinary um, and the appeal. Um, and it's important that any evidence that's discussed or relied on is retained and available should it become necessary to defend against legal proceedings. One of the things I see regularly is a failure to take proper notes of discussions, particularly investigation discussions. Um, now, the best way to address that is to have a separate note taker in the meetings whose sole purpose is to keep a record of those discussions. Um, it can be anyone that's capable of taking good notes, really. It doesn't have to be anyone in HR or management or anything else. Um, HR professionals are often brought in to, uh, appointed in, in these sorts of matters to keep a record, which is fine. Um, but an HR person is also there to ensure the process is properly followed. Um, so they kind of have a dual role, but make sure you're taking good notes of those meetings and, and the matters that are being dealt with. The only other thing to say really is that the chairperson of any disciplinary meeting should have authority to make a decision about the outcome. So what I often see is um, a line manager conducting a hearing, but actually the outcome is decided by a direct director or someone more senior than the line manager, um, which means really the line manager isn't the one making the disciplinary decision. So they shouldn't really be the one conducting the disciplinary. Um, part of the reason for that is that the line manager is likely to find it quite difficult to properly articulate the reasons for a decision being made if it wasn't their decision. When you're looking at an unfair dismissal claim in tribunal, the tribunal will always want to hear from the disciplining officer. They will probably want to hear from the investigating officer as well. So it all applies. The investigating officer needs to be able to decide whether or not there's a case to answer. They want to hear from both of those people. Um, because they want to understand what factors were taken into account in making the decision and why they made a decision. So if someone else has actually decided what the outcome is going to be, it's quite difficult for the disciplining officer to articulate their reasoning and then it really puts you on the back foot in tribunal. So that's really worth bearing in mind, authority to actually make decisions, both investigation and disciplinary and appeal stage. Um, and that's really everything I wanted to cover with you. And um, I hope it's been helpful. But obviously, if you've got any questions, let us know and I'll just hand you back to Marie. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so we have had quite a number of questions come through, so I'll just go through them um, uh, in, in order. Um, just a note, I know there's a few that come from the chat and I'll just try and keep an eye on them. But if we can um, get the questions in the Q&A box just so that we're not scrolling through the chats to make sure that we're not losing them. That would be great. Okay, the first question from Saab is, um, to have a non-contractual disciplinary procedure, do we need to make reference to a procedure in the contract? There's always a requirement to reference the procedure in the contract, but you do it to the extent of, you will find our disciplinary procedure in this location. So you point them to it so they can find it you don't have to put the actual steps and stages of that disciplinary procedure into the contract. As soon as you start putting more detail and actual steps into the contract, that's when it begins to become contractual. Okay. Um, does the employee against whom the allegation are made 
is made, needs to be told that there's an investigation and what the allegations are and is this too early? Or is this too early in case no evidence is found? Um, it depends on the allegation. Um, as I sort of mentioned, it can be approached in a couple of different ways. You can either do some investigation before you speak to them and tell them that that investigation is happening to see whether or not there is even an issue to talk to them about. Um, and or if you kind of already know there is an issue or you need to speak to them to find out whether there's an issue, then you might talk to them and tell them about the investigation first. It, it really depends on what it is you're investigating um, and both, both are fine. Um, but once you've decided that you do need to progress to speaking to the employee or there does appear to be some evidence that suggests there's an issue, that's when you need to be telling them that the investigation is happening. Okay, and Debbie asked, did you say it was good practice to give 48 hours notice for an investigation meeting or that no notice was necessary? For an investigation meeting, there's no legal requirement to give notice or send a formal invite. Um, so an investigation meeting, you might just ask the employee to come in and talk to you um, without any notice and talk to them about the investigation there, particularly where it's an issue where you actually need to find out a bit more from them before deciding whether to investigate further. What I would say is it's often best practice to invite them to a, an investigation meeting if you've already done some investigation and it's fairly clear that you're going to need to talk to them about something and there probably is an issue. Um, and if you are going to invite them in advance, 48 hours notice is recommended. It's not legally required, but it is recommended. Um, and the purpose of the 48 hours is to give them time to prepare. Um, because if they don't know what they're coming into, uh, or they think they need some time to talk to somebody, to gather some evidence ahead of time to answer what it is they've come to talk to you about, then they need time to do that. Okay, uh, next question. In your experience, what are the most common areas that employers can fall short during the process? Investigation, mm. why, why we're talking about it really, um, which is not doing sufficient investigation um, and maybe just rushing it through to disciplinary without actually looking in detail at things, not actually asking people the questions. And it commonly falls down not talking to witnesses, um, or certainly not taking any sort of formal statements from witnesses, not talking to witnesses that an employee flags up um, is a common one. So you talk to the employee and they say, you need to speak to so-and-so about this. Um, and the employer doesn't. Sometimes that happens where the person that the employee wants you to speak to is no longer employed. Um, or maybe they're on holiday or it's just not necessarily convenient, but you, you do need to make sure you're taking steps to try and talk to everybody that you need to talk to. Um, so key, one of the main ones is the investigation. Um, the other thing that I see very commonly is when a disciplinary outcome or decision is made, and then some disciplining officers find it really hard to explain why they're making that decision. Um, and that's a real common area of problem. And it, it, it happens in circumstances where employers kind of already know what outcome they want um, or they think they already know. But the disciplinary, the, the evidence they've found during the disciplinary or the investigation doesn't necessarily match up with being able to make that decision or making a decision that's too severe. So it's really important that the disciplining officer can explain why they're making the decision. Um, and I think they're the two key ones, really. Could HR be the investigating officer and then take notes in the hearing? Yes. Um, the a HR are normally there to advise on procedure. Um, they are not really meant to be involved in any of the decision making process. But that doesn't mean they absolutely can't be where it's appropriate. So you may find that actually having an HR person do the investigation is better if you're going to find yourself in a position where you don't have enough managers, for example, to do each of those stages. What I would say is that try to avoid having the HR 
person deal with the disciplinary or make the decision on the disciplinary unless obviously it's within the HR team and they are the line manager um, because there have have been criticisms made of procedures where an HR officer is the one that made decisions on sanctions rather than the disciplining officer um, and, and it, it can get a bit mixed up but in theory yes they can if it's appropriate and it's still going to be fair. The note taker obviously isn't involved in any decision making, they're literally just keeping a record. So as long as the HR person doesn't overstep that and start chipping in with questions or um, helping with the decision making or things like that, and they literally just take notes, it's okay. When you start to overstep that, that, that becomes a problem. Okay, then related to that about the HR reps, um, would you say that the HR rep needs to be a different at each stage? Not necessarily. If the HR rep is there purely to advise on procedure and take notes and they're not actually going to go any further than that, they're not involved in asking questions, they're not involved in the decision making, then in theory you could have the same HR person deal with, have that role at each stage. Um, there's nothing legally wrong with that, but if you do have the resources to have a different HR person take notes or advise on procedure, at each stage, particularly the disciplinary and appeal stage, it is better to do that because it appears fairer. Um, and with employees, one of the real keys is making sure that the procedure appears to be fair. Um, and I don't say that in the sense of you can just pretend that it's fair and show it's fair when actually it's not. I mean, not only are you making sure it's fair, but it is going to be visibly fair. Um, so if you can do it separate, do it separate. If you can't, you're not massively going to fall foul of any specific um, legal requirements. Okay. Uh, next question. Sorry, I've got quite a lot coming in. I'm hopefully, right. hopefully trying to get through them before um, 11. Um, Amy asks, in the letter inviting for dis disciplinary, would you include all evidence in full, including the employee statements? You would include <laughs> Oops, sorry, <evidence>. dog. <laughs> <gasps> yeah, you, you include copies of all evidence, absolutely everything. Um, so that's even evidence that would suggest that they haven't done what's being alleged. Um, so you would definitely include all witness statements or notes of witness meetings, as well as any documentary evidence, because the employee has the right to see that to be able to properly present their argument. Um, so even if you've got witnesses that one says it happened, one says it doesn't, the employee should get to see both of those. I think you're on mute. On mute, sorry, <laughs> dog mute. Uh, does an investigatory process need to be kept confidential? If so, are there any tips to help with this? Confidentiality is quite a tricky one with investigations and disciplinaries um, because you're all, in many of those kinds of scenarios, you're gonna have to speak to witnesses. So obviously then, you, you can't keep it completely confidential because you're going to have to talk to certain people. Um, in order to get certain evidence, you might have to talk to other people. So you might have to talk to your IT supplier to get hold of copies of emails and things. So what you can never really do is say that it's confidential solely between the employee and the officers involved in the process because there are going to be a wider remit. But there is an expectation you can require it to be confidential within that circle of people. So anyone that actually is needed to input into that process will be expected to keep it confidential. Um, so you're not going to go and talk more widely and you're not going to expect people that you've spoken to as part of your investigation to tell anybody else. Um, so there is an element of confidentiality but within a certain group of people. The best way really to try and make sure that happens, and you can never absolutely 100% guarantee it because we're dealing with people, but the best way to try and make sure that happens is to make sure that whenever you speak to somebody involved in the process, you make it clear to them that it is confidential. They must not speak to anybody else about it outside of the room um, and make sure they're aware that if they do, it could lead to disciplinary action against them because it's a breach of confidentiality. Um, so making that absolutely clear and express will go a long way to making sure people know what they can and can't do. And ultimately, then, if you find out they have spoken to someone, act on it, deal with it. And then over time, you will then um, build a picture that it is not accepted and there will be consequences. 
Um, true. Um, next one is an interesting one. Um, in situations where a head of department is being investigated, what approach could be taken in terms of who can conduct the disciplinary hearing and appeal? Obviously, it depends on your structure. Um, because a head of department um, obviously is very senior, but if there are still people more senior than your head of department, then you'll be looking to them. You can have somebody on the same level in, do, do part of the process because they are sufficiently senior still to make decisions. They're not going to be hindered by a head of department's um, seniority because they're on the same level. Uh, so you can look same level and above. Where you get into difficulties is where you either don't have anybody above. So, for example, allegations against directors are often quite tricky um, where there's no seniority to the director levels um, or where you maybe only have one person that's on the same level or more senior. So you can't then cover the three stages. Um, the when you're talking about fair procedures, as I said in my discussion, the tribunal does take into account the size and resources of the business. So the main thing to do is to make sure that whatever process you can put in place is as fair as possible. Um, so it might mean that you look at in, um, uh, um, instructing someone external, for example, to actually help with that process. So for example, we have an HR projects team here who can go out on site, carry out investigations, hold disciplinary meetings and make clear recommendations about what outcomes or decisions should be. You still need somebody within the business to actually authorise a decision, but by having that independent investigation, um, it really helps to show a tribunal that you've done absolutely everything to be fair and to be reasonable. Um, so that's worth considering if you can. Um, yeah, look at same level above and then independent if you can. Um, but don't panic if you can't. You can only do the best with what you've got. Okay, I had a couple of questions around resources and I wondered whether potentially you might send some resources. So some people are asking about whether there's a standard template for a formal report um, or any booklets and materials on the topic that you might be able to share and then we could potentially pass them on in the follow-up or perhaps people can get in contact with you directly. So um, we have an internal template that our HR projects team uses to uh, report on investigations to our clients. Um, and they've developed that based on their own experience and what they think is, is important to cover. Um, but there's no sort of prescribed form um, as such. It's really about what works. Whether or not I can share that, I'll need to check. Um, because, as I say, that is something developed by the HR project team, but I can find out whether that's something they're able and willing to share. Um, and I'll feed that back once I've been able to check with them. OK, brilliant. Um, next one. Um, in terms of suspensions, then, uh, what's the good practice in terms of suspending uh, to invest? Do you investigate before you suspend? I think like that's the yeah, so it can be quite tricky with suspensions now because it used to be that there was an accepted view that suspensions were not part of a disciplinary process, they were independent, and you very rarely had to explain yourself with suspensions. But the view on that changed a couple of years ago, um, might be three years ago. I get my timescales all mixed up with lockdowns and everything else. But um, relatively recently it changed and it's now accepted that it is definitely part of your disciplinary procedure because it has an impact on the employee. And what that means is you have to be really careful about when you suspend and in what circumstances, because it needs to be necessary and reasonable to suspend. You can't just suspend because it's easier. You have to have a good reason. Um, when you do suspend, you have to pay in full during suspension. So you don't really want to be suspending unnecessarily anyway. Um, but the way I approach it and the way I advise my clients is to make sure you're doing a risk assessment, looking at are there any, well, what are you trying to actually protect by suspending? What are you trying to achieve by having the employee out of the workforce? And are there any other ways to achieve that short of suspension? So one example um, to give with that would be if you've got someone who is maybe 
being investigated, their job is to give medication in a care home, for example. And actually they're being investigated for a fairly serious breach of that medical procedure. They may be given the wrong medication, not given medication, that kind of thing. You might look to suspend because you'd consider that possibly gross misconduct because it's such a serious issue. But actually looking at it, could you protect people by doing something short of suspension? Well, yes, you could take away their sort of prescribing rights, for example. Um, so that actually you achieve that protection of your uh, service users, but without having the employee out of the workforce. So it depends what you're trying to achieve and you do need to risk assess. Um, and the uh, and solicitors now are very much on suspension and investigating why suspension was done and will include it in a question of fairness if they feel that suspension was heavy handed. Okay, a uh, couple of questions around availability. So um, the question here about good practice, is it good practice to pause an investigation if someone you need to speak to is as part of the investigations on, on holiday? And also I guess then related to that is what happens if the employee isn't available for an investigation meeting? So availability, um, if you need to speak to someone and that's witnesses all the employee, then you're really going to have to wait for them to be available because you can't make any decisions or you certainly can't make any fair decisions about progressing matters without having the evidence. Um, so if you need that evidence, you have to wait. Um, if the employee is not available on a given date, then you look at an alternative date. If actually it's about coming into the workplace or they're off sick or there's some other factor that makes them unavailable, it's about looking at other alternatives. So can you actually do the meetings by video conferencing, for example, can you use Zoom or Teams? Um, could you do it on the phone initially? Uh, could you meet them in another location? Could you do the questions in writing? So looking at how you can get them to participate in another way. Um, and all of those are options depending on the circumstances. But yeah, essentially, if you need the evidence, you need the evidence. Um, I, I, th I don't think I answered the, on the suspension question. I don't think I answered the question about whether or not you have to investigate first. Um, yes, you do, because you can't make a decision about whether suspension is necessary without knowing whether or not there's a case to answer um, or whether there's any evidence that something's happened. So you do need to do an element of investigation first. That could just be talking to the employee um, to find out what their version of events is and then deciding to suspend off the back of that. It might be that actually what you investigate is more documentary stuff, but there will be need to be an element of investigation before you suspend. Okay. Um, if Sarah asks, if during the investigation, the original issue is found to be untrue or non-existent, but the investigation throws up other different issues uh, that are raised concerning the same people, do you have to start the whole process again? If you're at investigation stage, you're already only at the beginning anyway. Um, so if you find that the allegation you were initially investigating, there's no case to answer, that's fine. You report back to them, there's no case to answer on this allegation. But then what you would need to do is carry out an investigation into the other matters that have arisen, because there is always going to be a need to investigate whatever allegation it is that's being made, because you're always going to have to look at gathering the right evidence, talking to the right people. Um, but investigation comes right at the beginning. So you're never going to have been that far down the road anyway. Um, but yeah, you would throw away one case and begin with another, essentially. Okay, uh, a few more, few more minutes. Um, do staff in probationary periods subject to capability disciplinary investigation? Oh, so are they subject to the disciplinary investigation or they, can they just be dismissed if they're on probation? Uh, always an interesting question. Um, people that are in probation have the same rights as any other employee when it comes to applying procedures and things. But often the uh, probation is always a funny one. Um, but the thing to remember, and this often crops up because employees that have less than two years service don't have a right to make a normal unfair dismissal claim. So if you want to dismiss an employee with less than two years service for a misconduct issue, then potentially you can do that without following procedure because they can't make an unfair dismissal claim. And the procedure is the thing that they will 
that, that forms part of an unfair dismissal claim. You can't challenge a procedure out with an unfair dismissal claim unless it's a contractual procedure and you're doing a breach of contract claim. But that's actually quite rare. Um, so someone that's in probation is going to have less than two years service. So in theory, you could dismiss them without going through that process. However, there's always a caveat to that because you, I will always advise that there's an element of investigation anyway. And I, the reason I say that is because until you actually investigate and talk to people, what you can't assess is whether or not there might be some other issue over and above the misconduct issue that could create risk. So for example, could there be any form of discrimination? Um, because discrimination claims can be brought from day one. They don't have to have a certain amount of service. And there are also certain specific unfair dismissal claims where you don't need service. So that could be, for example, a dismissal related to taking maternity leave or a dismissal relating to reporting health and safety issues. So there are some areas where you have to be careful. And to make sure that you can assess whether those are a risk, then you'll need to do some form of investigation ahead of any dismissal. Um, but ultimately it's going to be lower risk. Um, it's never no risk, but it would be low risk. Okay. Um, just a few more before we have to wrap up. Um, what's your view on doing an investigation report which summarises findings rather than, I guess, explicitly showing the actual notes and, and evidence? Um, it's fine to do a report that summarises findings, but if you are going to invite to a disciplinary, the employee is going to need to see the actual statements and things anyway because they have to see the actual evidence. So the report can summarise, that's fine, um, but you can't sort of withhold the actual evidence when it comes to the disciplinary stage. If actually you're deciding there's no case to answer um, and not taking it to disciplinary, then a summary report and not providing the evidence is ultimately fine. Um, but yeah, they'll need to see the evidence anyway at disciplinary, so it's kind of up to you how detailed you make your report at that point. Okay, I think, and probably the last one, um, so we've had a couple around like uh, different people doing different things. On In terms of the um, investigation meetings, do you have to send an invite out to it and does the employee have a right to be accompanied? So there's no formal requirement to send an invite to an investigation meeting. I think I covered this a little, er a little earlier. Um, there's no formal right um, or expectation necessarily that there is an invite in advance of an investigation meeting. You can just hold an investigation meeting, but there may be circumstances where it's preferable to do an invite. And that could be in complex matters where you need them to actually consider evidence ahead of a meeting. It could be where they're maybe not in the workplace. So you're going to have to give them notice so that they can actually attend. Um, or it may be that actually your procedure says that you have to do an invite. Um, because you, even though a procedure is non-contractual, the tribunal will still look at whether or not you've followed your process and will be asking why you haven't if you haven't. Um, so it's worth checking. Um, but no, there's no formal right to that. And in terms of being accompanied, no, there's no legal right to be accompanied at an investigation meeting. Okay, great. I think we're going to have to, unfortunately, this, we've, we've covered most of the questions. Hopefully we've covered... Um, as many as, as possible. I mean, obviously, we will be doing a um, we'll do a follow up email with the recording, and also um, if, if you do have any questions, you could always contact Sarah Sarah directly. But um, thank you, Sarah. Otherwise, for your time this morning, um, I appreciate. There's a lot of questions. I think you went through about like, 24, 25 <laughs> questions. Um, just a reminder to people, I, I did put a registration link in the chat for the next one around managing flexible. Uh, I think flexible working. Uh, patterns um so if you would like to join that please do sign up to that but otherwise uh thank you again sarah and um enjoy the rest of the day everyone else thank you